what is good our people our sports listeners our fans who are devoted to listening to us hopefully um you know if you don't want to listen to us anymore i don't blame you me and booth are kind of kind of lame but we got another episode of two dudes with some balls for you jacob booth what's good yes sir what's up everyone everyone say hi everyone say hello it's gonna be a good time today a little little wrap on some world series action as we get ready to go into game six a little nba talk about some hot teams off to the rip maybe a little jersey thing because i like talking to booth about jerseys and then just a slight talk on the nfl a little bit but hey we are starting this now where we're dropping episodes not monday at eight eastern time Tuesday at 8 Eastern time. It, it uh, helps both our schedules a lot better, the editing process, the recording process. So here we go. And what better time to start it? Drop an episode for you, not on the off day, but on the day of game six of the 2021 World Series, where the Atlanta Braves head to Houston, a venue switch again. We lost Booth. He dipped off the screen for a second. But anyways, 3-2 series lead for the Braves after dropping game five at home. And it starts at 8.09 Eastern time today. And we got Max Freed, who is 0-1 in this World Series, with a 10.81 ERA versus Luis Garcia, who's 0-1 but pitched very well, only a 2.5 ERA in this game. Max Freed's got to be the topic of discussion here. He's he's pitched really well all year. I think he was 14-7, if I remember right. And the regular season was highly noted, regarded as a great pitcher this year. Came into his shoes, kind of everyone knew that he was going to be a good baseball pitcher. I don't know why I said it like that, baseball pitcher. But... In the World Series, maybe the moment got a little too big for him, you know. It's a whole different ball game. but I think Mike said he's supposed to, in our last podcast, that he was going to be a difference maker, and he is a difference maker, but it's going to have to be a big game. And Luis Garcia has shown, he pitched in that big game against Boston, that he can come out and shove. And now that the series is back in Houston, do the Braves have something to worry about, Jacob Booth? Uh, I think they still have 3-2, so they're in the – I got to stop saying I think when I start off everything, but they're, they're still in the driver's seat here with a 3-2 lead. Uh, I know Max Fried is uh, kind of struggling. He's uh, one and two with a 4.98 ERA in the playoffs, it looks like. But he also has 23 strikeouts to three walks, which is kind of an insane ratio for uh, the the, the win loss and the ERA that he's put up. But um, I, I think they're still in a good spot to win it. And I know our predictions were uh, Houston in six and Houston in seven. But Houston seven. But uh, I think it, it's 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 all Mike now, and the, the Braves are going to get it done next game. Mike did say our guest feature in last week, last week's podcast, the Braves in six. I I disagree. Houston in seven. I'm sticking Houston in seven. Don't let don't let Houston win tonight or yeah tonight. Don't let him win tonight. Max Freed, the thing you brought up about the strikeout to walk ratio. You're right. He he doesn't have a lot of walks. The problem with him is he's competing in the zone, which is what you want, but he's not competing in the right part of the zone. He's leaving balls up and over the heart of the plate, and that's what got him six earned runs in game one of this World Series. But Austin Riley, who was hot in the NLCS, if Eddie Rosario didn't pop off, he probably would have been the NLCS MVP. But he's hitting 381 in this World Series, eight hits, three RBIs, been on fire. He's probably my pick right now to be the World Series MVP. Travis Darno has been sneaky pop 350 batting average and slugging 700 with two bombs himself. Those are his only two RBIs. On the other side, uh, Eddie Rosario is hitting pretty well too. Uh, but on the other side, Michael Brantley just picking it up 300 batting average still. Correa enters tonight. He's probably been the biggest clutch bat, I'd say, of uh, Houston hitting 263 with a 649 OPS, has four runs driven in. My big pick for Houston's offense, though, and just overall player in this World Series has been Martin Maldonado, the catcher, who's doing it all now because Castro got hurt. Um, but he's hitting 200, which is not impressive, but he has four RBIs. I think he's coming up and he's not getting hits. He has five strikeouts, but he's when they need him to do a job, he had a big sack fly the other night. He moves guys over. As a catcher, that's all you're really asking for in the World Series. And he's been my pick behind Yuli Gurriel is hitting 333 to just who's been the biggest key factor in this Astros lineup. The missing piece is Jordan Alvarez, as the LCS MVP. But if you're asking me, the uh, series for him. Yeah, not a good not instead a good of his uh, ALCS series. Yeah. Oh, I mean, and that's kind of what if you're a Braves fan, you're, you're maybe a little worried about <laughs> that he heats up. My, my two big factors going into game six, how game six is going to be won on either side. It's been a bullpen series. It's been a very big bullpen World Series, and the Braves' bullpen has either been very good or very bad. We saw Minter, who has been lights out this whole postseason, really get kind of hit hard in game five and, and struggle a little bit. He has thrown a lot, though, but I think the Braves' bullpen, if they're on, they can win the series because you don't know how long you're going to get out of Max Freed. He needs to have a big start, and then the bullpen needs to – 
do what it does best and close this thing out. That's what's helped them so well in this postseason. But the Astros are starting to show again what they did to the Red Sox from a first half to second half of that series. That second half, the bullpen came through and the bats launched. Nine runs in game five yesterday or two days ago when this is coming out. And don't let that offense get hot. And that's, if you're a Braves fan, Jordan Alvarez heating up in game six and potentially game seven could be the end of your World Series. On the other hand, if you're an Astros fan or just a viewer in general, what the Astros should be worried about is Jorge Soler. When Jorge Soler hits a bomb, they win. And going back to Houston now, he could be the designated hitter, which I assume he will be, and gives him more opportunities. Came in in game four with a huge pinch hit home run. That was ace if you heard a little whine. Uh, my dog, I promise he's not held captive. But I think those are your two big two big factors from the offensive side. I think the bullpen wins game six. Win or loses you game six. But I think the two offensive players who are going to matter in this game six are Jordan Alvarez and Jorge Soler. Anything you want to add on this potential two games coming up? Uh, someone that's kind of flown under the radar in the bullpen is Will Smith. Uh, the whole postseason, I don't think he's given up one run. Um, three innings pitched against the Astros. Only one hit, one walk given up, and one strikeout. Just every time he comes in, he just gets the job done. So I I, I imagine he's going to have a big part in game six here to, uh, tomorrow, right? Or well, uh, today. You know what? That's actually a really good point. And I, I think I, that, I knew he was pitching really well, but I think that stat flew under even my radar, which I try to look at all these things, but that's impressive. Very. And he's going to have to, I'm, I think ideally if you're, if you're the Braves, you want Max Freed to give you five. You're just hoping for five, five innings. And on the Astro side, the same thing. You want Luis Garcia to give you five, five good innings. Uh, I think it's, like I said, it's going to come down to the bullpen. Starting pitching hasn't really been the factor of this world series. And that's, we said it's going to be a factor, who's, but not in the factor of how you win. It's going to be who's starting pitching, being banged up, and not as fresh is going to, you know, prevail. And the obviously the rookie Ian Anderson had a very good start. He might be slotted for Game Seven already. I don't, I don't know. I don't think you plan that far ahead when you're in the driver's seat to win. I don't think you announce your Game Seven starter yet when you have a chance to close out Game Six. Just makes sense, the rules of baseball. But yeah. The next two games being in Houston, um, there's a little bit less pressure on the starting pitchers because they won't be hidden, obviously. Yeah. So I mean, does. hey, give props to Zach Grank. You might see him get a pinch hit and <laughs> just in general. When he came in, that's the best thing I've ever seen. In, in game five, Crazy. he comes in and gets a, just a laser line drive in a right. It was sick. Oh, yeah. Him wearing the jacket, though, I think that's the softest thing ever when they make the pitchers. And Grank, you probably didn't want to wear the jacket when he runs the bases, but I think that's so dumb the night he was pitching and he had a hit. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's some MLB show type stuff. But it's just a little cold, you know. I'm just glad it, we can keep talking about the World Series, but I think we got the main points out. I'm just glad it, it at least hit six games. I don't, I don't necessarily want the Astros to win, other than my prediction of Houston seven. Um, I'm just really glad. I didn't want that to end in five. It would have sucked. I'm playing both sides right now. I predicted the Astros in six on one, Braves in six on the other. So <laughs> either way, I mean, each game has been very good for the most part. Even even a nine five, it was nine five, I think, in game uh five. It started off four and four nothing. Braves looking like they're gonna win, and the Astros just chip, 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 and then boom, big innings. Once the Astros scored two in the in the after the four run inning in the bottom of the first, I kind of felt like they were gonna take over, and they just did that. They great coaching, a deep lineup that shows, and their bullpen came through big and that's that's what you need out of world series and that's what you need out of game six but i think that's good a good wrap up on the mlb right there houston seven will be our first prediction right of this whole time we've been on the podcast together so i'm hoping that happens but not really um screw the astros leave it at that let's move on to uh the nba which is uh honestly i i've been having a lot of fun watching the nba so far and just paying attention to it uh, i just want to talk about you know maybe a few teams that have been just really good uh, new fresh teams that have emerged and they're not the favorites kind of like what we talked about in the power rankings that first week, but I'm going to start off with the Knicks. I think D Rose and Kimba Walker have meshed to be a good duo that they can rely on. And the pressure's not on either of them to be the star player anymore. And they're just playing very well together. I mean, Kimba has 15 points per game, which is great. And he's also leading the team in steals with 1.7 steals per game and RJ Barrett, and Evan Fournier, which Evan Fournier was a great pickup for that Knicks team, They're both putting up over 17 points per game. And then you give it to the star, Julius Randle, almost 21 points per game. And he's also got 11.2 rebounds to go along with 6.5 assists and just over one block per game. He's he's a stud. He's a star. He's building off last year. I think he's only going to get better. 
and uh, could probably compete to be one of the best players in the Eastern Conference this year, the whole NBA in general. But that Knicks team looking deep, looking like they have multiple rotations and have started off the season very well. The team I've really liked so far is the Chicago Bulls. Uh, they got two great players in Zach Levine and DeMar DeRozan. Uh, DeRozan's just looked unbelievable this year. He's actually able to show off a new uh, part of his game with that three ball that he's been hitting. Yeah, and that team's been fun to watch. I think uh, DeMar DeRozan, some are saying that he's the best shooting guard that the Chicago Bulls have ever seen. But <laughs> some people are saying that at least. How about this for, for the Chicago Bulls? You talk about another team that I think has a deep core uh, in, in a building core that might even make some moves down the road if they keep competing at the way they are. Maybe some more trades. Obviously, adding Lonzo Ball is so big. But there's two players that I really want to point out in the things that they're doing is Nikola, Nikola Vucevic. can't pronounce his name ever. Every time I try to say it, I butcher it. But he's got 11 rebounds per game, which is kind of expected. But he's being a presence in the paint and just getting boards on both offense and defense side, which is huge to kick it back out to Levine, DeRozan, um, you know, Ball, anyone else that's on the floor, even this guy. Alex Caruso is averaging 2.7 steals per game. His I always thought his defense was good being a role player for the Lakers. And that's kind of, you know, you don't rely on him too much for scoring, but he is an aggressive defender and he plays defense very clean and just a pickpocket machine so far through the early parts of the season. So I, I really like this Bulls team too. I agree with you. So, I think Vucevic is one of the most like underrated players in the league. He oh, consistently yeah. averages double doubles. I mean, it's just where he was before and not yeah. – you know, in the magic, in Orlando, yeah. it's not, they don't get attention. And, and honestly, you know, for a couple of years, they were sneaking in the playoffs and being an okay team, but just, you know, it's not a great market, but Chicago, I think the it's team good. Weird with so many big men too. Yeah, that's true. I think um, it's good to see Chicago basketball being good again, especially for that city in a way, uh, just with the bears and stuff. I'm comparing other sports, but the bears suck. The Cubs suck. The White Sox are, you know, a south side team. Got their hat on tonight, though. Um, but, yeah, so it's good to see the Bulls basketball playing well again. The Eastern Conference is – I think it's going to be the better conference this year in terms of, like, close matchups, deeper playoff, one through eight, and one through nine, those play-in games, I guess. And then the one other team, another Eastern Conference team that I've been impressed with so far is the Washington Wizards. And I, I really didn't think this team would impress me, and it might just be a little early run. But, first off, I'm going to pay my respect to Kyle Kuzma. And I hate to do it because I think he's garbage. But, dude, he – when a guy talks like the way he talked about, I need to get traded, I'm not getting opportunities, and like what you've seen from him so far, it, it's you have to back that up, right? I mean, there's no excuse, and he, he's doing it. 15.5 points per game, which is solid. What's the really impressive number for me is 11.8 rebounds, almost 12 rebounds per game, doing great job being just a board monster for the Wizards, and he's shooting 42.2% from the field. You're, he you're hesitant right here. What do you have to say? I just every time I hear Kyle Kuzma's name, I just think about that photo of him with the trophy by all the ass. <laughs> I, mean, I just can't take him partner. seriously. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> but, well, okay, well, you, you know, we'll post this picture. That picture that you're talking about is he picked the most like dirtiest corner in like the bubble, and like it, it's not even a good camera angle. It's not the right angle. There's no filter on it to like make it look vintage, like Kobe. Like I obviously I get what you're doing. He got wrecked for that. And you weren't even obviously you so. didn't even do anything in that in that NBA Finals. You sucked. Um, I think Lakers fans are glad he's gone. I don't even think they're necessarily happy that he's doing good in Washington. But congrats to him because he talked a lot this off season, and I thought he was going to fail, but he's doing really good. But it's not just about him. Obviously, Bradley Beal is a star. Um, Twenty four point four points per game, and he's still just under five assists. I think they got. I think they really have four players who make up a good starting core for them, and that's in Beal and Kuzma, like I mentioned. But Montrezl Harrell is a great defender, aggressive defender, like I said. Uh, good job boxing people out, getting boards. And then Spencer Dinwiddie filling into a bigger role than what he had before. I think with this Washington team could be a good fit, and they could be a you know a middle-of-the-pack uh, playoff contender Eastern Conference team, like a 5-6 seed. I really think so. So. Any other NBA team you want to cover or player or anything? No. Well, no, let's talk about a, a little a little uh, thing you hate talking about, and that's that's jerseys in general, man. I we both have our phones here. There's a tweet about it. Have you looking at these these city edition jerseys for this year? What do you, who do you like? I think they're all so sick. I don't think there's a bad one this year, which is rare. Yeah. Um. Why, why don't you go first? Because I'm I'm still uh, working my way through. Personally. 
I'm probably I'm probably the biggest fan of the Lakers one. I just like that little old school look, and I think the color of like the purple and like the lighter blue with the little stars next to the number is a really nice touch. Um, outside of that, I really like the Memphis Grizzlies. I I like the navy blue with the the woodmark pattern they have along the shorts and the and the collar. I think that's a good look. And uh, I always love seeing Sacktown on on the Kings jerseys. You know, big. It's like that we should be their sponsor. You know how they have like sponsors on top, like Sacktown, two dudes with some balls on that hat. We got to make it big for that one, okay? Two dudes with some balls on the Kings jerseys. If you're if you're watching this, tag the Kings on our TikTok, man. We want to we want to be their their sack. Um, that's that's enough on their promotion. Other than that, I I got to go with my my favorite one. Maybe not my favorite, but my I like the design of the Houston Rockets one. I would never buy one because I don't like anybody on the Rockets. Um, but I think just going back to the Heritage uh, throwback jerseys with this NBA 75 season is, is a really good look. And I, I like the design of that one. The one I really like is the Atlanta Hawks. I just think it's a, it's an interesting take on their jersey. And, and, and I like the I, – I don't know if I'm really rocking with the all yellow like that, but yeah. um, I think I think it's, a, it's a cool. I think the logo covering it, you know, the yeah. old school logo, like, again, touching on that NBA 75 stuff. Like a lot of teams did a throwback type jersey, and I think that's awesome. Um, Tell me why the Celtics come out with a jersey every year that just green with like, the like, the thing is the Celtics can't do anything bad necessarily. Like they don't ever have a jersey that's like okay, this jersey sucks, but they can't have a jersey that's good at the same time. Like, yeah, well, I just feel like they just roll out the same thing and call it. I mean, yeah, they they're so like they're like the Penn State in the USC of like the NBA. You know, like yeah. they're not going to change their jerseys; they're going to make minor tweaks to them when you can um the fact that the lakers even like went like this route is kind of different for their team i feel like but when you have lebron you're going to be a little flashy i feel like if it was like still the kobe area i don't think you see that um the most i think the worst city edition jersey in this is the oklahoma city thunder i hate them in general um bring back the sonics but just like the all white for them like what does that even resemble for them probably because they have no room to make a throwback type jersey because if they tried to go in a sonics direction it would not be sold well and and then uh the pelicans jersey kind of sucks too just looks like their normal jersey with nola on it instead of like pelicans i don't like uh when teams like the thunder go with that vertical logo or vertical uh, the text yeah yeah yeah. no i I just think it looks sloppy yeah i think it's a very lazy jersey but really i mean all these are are pretty good I, i think this is the best layout of all 30 30 teams or whatever it is uh, for the city edition usually i feel like half of them are terrible and the other half are like just okay and then there's one or two that are really good but i, I like all of them this year so hey thanks for talking talking uniforms for once and actually having an in-depth conversation about this hey, well, been complaining at all too so yeah claps for booth in the chat i'll give you that let's let's move on to the last topic of the day and just uh, talk about the nfl a little bit and two big injuries this this weekend obviously our dear boy, James Winston, goes down. How are you feeling, first off? Because, you know. I was, I was pretty down at first and then went on Instagram later, saw a nice video of him dancing. He's a big team guy. Yeah, just, yeah. just love to see it. Torn yeah. ACL and dancing. Who else? Who does that? No one. No. You're not seeing Ross do that after he breaks no. his finger. You no. seeing him talk about football and stuff? No. We no. need that, that spiritual leader like James Winston. No one's better than him. <laughs> I love that, man. I really – and you're right, man. He, he's going to be big on the bench. The Saints are only what would be in terms of baseball terminology. They're only half a game back of the Bucks because the Bucks haven't had their bye week and the Saints have. Now it kind of hurts them, but there's really – you think the Saints can still make the playoffs? I mean, they just beat the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with, I mean, half a game with Trevor Simeon. So, yeah. It's a good sign. It was pretty much a like a must win game if they wanted to win the division. So um, they're in a good spot here, even even though they're a half game back, like you said. Get to ten wins, you have a shot, and so they have to win five, five in the next ten weeks or whatever it is, nine weeks that they have games. Uh, you think they? I mean, I remember this being like a kind of a topic of discussion when the Seahawks lost for Russell Wilson. Do you think they try to make a move for maybe like Cam Newton or someone, or do you just rock with what you have? I think rock with what you have, and then you have all the gadget plays with Taysom Hill still. So I think I, that's what I was gonna say. It's very similar to the year before when Drew Brees went down. Yeah, for a little bit. Um, They've been here before. It's not like it's anything new. 
Yeah, the defense is – I think the defense uh, underperformed at times, but getting better each week, I think the defense has been – And you potentially have Michael Thomas coming back too. Um, yeah. You got, you got Mark Ingram back on the team. I know he's past his prime, but, yeah, more weapons. Uh, we know that him and Kamara work really well together. So I think they did like a post, uh, post-game post press conference together, and it was, it was pretty funny to watch. But Yeah, they're, they're – I think that was when the NFL was at its prime when they were playing together. Just uh, Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's gonna be a good thing for Mark Ingram too. We didn't plan on talking about him today, but just to see, was it, you know, was he struggling in the Raven system, or or is the Saint system just better for him? Does he kind of have a little more than what we've seen now, just working back in the Saint system? I, I imagine he'll be better results wise than he was. He was fine on the Ravens, but I think he started the year on the Texans, and even then he was fine. Yeah. He scored a few touchdowns. He just wasn't getting really consistent snaps and just yeah. got bounced around. But I, he he proved he still has um, gas left in the tank. So I, I'm actually, uh, I think it's a perfect fit for him here. And they might be able to get kind of like, and I don't think these running backs have been too great this year, but that Chubb uh, Hunt kind of duo, you know, back. So I, I like that. And that's kind of what people said when that was forming the Chubb and Hunt, that there was like Ingram and Kamara. So I like it. I like the move and you're right. It gives them a chance. That division has been pretty good so far, uh, you know, <laughs> three teams really competing to, for a playoff spot on that. And then the, right as – this is the point of the NFL that I wanted to get in today. Right as it kind of felt like an, a team from the AFC was emerging as a favorite, their best player goes down. Derrick Henry, it's like eight to ten weeks or something like that, I believe. Um, he's out. And that's why I was saying. The Titans were just about to pull away. It doesn't feel like there's a front runner in the AFC. Especially with the Bengals losing against the Jets. They have a different problem than what the NFC has. I don't necessarily think the NFC has a front runner either, but they have multiple teams who can be a front runner. Mm-hmm. Like the Cowboys are very good, the Packers are very good, the Cardinals are very good, and then the, the Bucks. Like they have four teams that are just really like almost elite. And then the AFC, it, it's not really there that you can't really tell. You thought, you know, you kind of felt like the Ravens were going to do it, then they lose. Then the Bengals have it, then they lose. Um, and, and the Titans just, like I said, looked like they had it and they were about to pull away and that injury hurts them. This is what makes the NFL so great. It's like any team can win on any night. So that's just mm-hmm. why it's probably the most exciting league and games to watch. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've talked about this team being a little disappointing, but even the chiefs and the giants are currently playing right now. And it's a little bit of a dog fight and it was a, a very, uh, good first half i'd say i mean maybe not as a fan on either side saying it's good but it's a close game and you're right that is with the nfl here's what i will say when we go actually i'll let you answer this question if you had to pick one right now as afc front runner who who are you going with that's a good question mm-hmm. i don't want to be i don't want to be biased but go for it baltimore ravens uh right. just the most talented offense in my opinion um and they have they have good players on defense obviously they don't always play that way as they've given up a lot of points to teams like the chiefs um they got blown out by the the, by the Bengals last week but coming off the bye week here uh, i expect a big game against minnesota and um, they have a relatively easy schedule games against miami um and chicago after that so i think they're in a good spot here um and and could easily come away with the number one seed. I think the only thing that's hurt the hurt the Ravens, and we knew that coming into the season, but it's clearly showing in the games they lose as how bad that Marcus Peters injury hurts. They are in desperate yeah. need for another cornerback, a DB that can just help a little bit because you when you can target that side, it's just it's easy points so far. Yeah. But they're often Especially against a team like the Bengals with multiple solid right. good receivers. Good receivers, very young, talented receiving core. Um yeah. Because you you don't have to just target Jamar Chase. You can go to Boyd. You can go to Higgins. Like, they have options as long as Burrow has time. And then the line, obviously, has played way better. I think um, my favorite is probably the Bills. Yeah. And, as, and, you know, there's been questions around the Bills, a couple close games. They really didn't look too impressive against Miami. But when you look at their losses, only week one against Pittsburgh, it was a seven-point loss. And week one is kind of a time – where you, you work out those kinks maybe that you just don't pick up in the preseason and your starting lines are just going the whole game for the first time and you, you see some things get exposed. And then their only other loss was a three-point loss to the Titans and with Henry, and now that Henry's Henry's down, uh, I see the Bills definitely, especially with the Jaguars coming up. They play the Jets after that, and they play play the Colts. They have a little bit of tough streak where they play the Bucks and the Saints, but the rest of their schedule is actually looks very easy and very winnable. This team could be a – Two or three lost team. If you know only yeah, one more loss, that's scary. 
right probably and if the they, best they defense in the up. league they heat up yeah I, I i think you're right but no i mean uh that's that's why like you're right you, anyone can be anyone on any given sunday or monday or thursday or whatever day you're playing and it'll be interesting to see how both sides shape up i, I like the nfc because of just how winning there's so many winning teams right now um this is uh, going off topic but do you see the did you see the brown browns and steelers game yeah without the kicker oh Should my gosh steelers? yeah i'm like so disappointed in uh in jarvis landry uh yeah he oof. did you see the play before where where baker mayfield runs gets popped late yeah gets hit and then just like fi- fires up the crowd like runs out and yeah. like Gets hype, and then the next play, Jarvis Landry Jarvis fumbles. Landry fumbles. Like, and it wasn't like he got popped. I think he thought he was going to get hit harder, and then he kind of got wrestled. It was an awkward play, and it was a good strip by the by the yeah. Steelers defense. But it was also a loose ball handling on his part. Yeah, uh, I just thought this control. was like when the Browns turned it around and uh, go on that win streak. And but no, I, I like Baker Mayfield. I I don't know if I like him, but I thought that you know you're right in it. And if you're home, that did fire up the crowd, and you could feel the energy, but. As a non-Browns fan, and I, I don't say I don't want to say I don't like Baker Mayfield. I, I have no like or dislike against him. I thought that was kind of eyewash. It's like, <laughs> I, like I, I don't it. know. Coming off the injury and everything. Yeah, I, I get it. Late, there was no flag, and it just. That's also a thing. If a defensive player does that, maybe makes a good interception or recovers a fumble, and then kind of gets popped out of bounds, and then runs up and does that. Is there a taunting penalty called? Because taunting seems. Like 85% of the time so far, this new taunting rule, the NFL taunting penalties are so dumb. It seems like 85% of the time it's going towards a defensive player and then an offensive receiver can make a play and then go up and spin the ball in front of the defender or give them the first down signal. Like if a defensive player does anything, they're, they're, getting, they're getting flagged for that. Yeah, shrugs. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I'm. I I wondered. That's the first thing that kind of, other than my mind being like, that's kind of eyewash Baker, but I understand it. Like that was my second thought. Like, that's probably a taunting penalty if that's a defensive back, but you know you don't know the game. The game's weird. Yeah, I mean, who you who are you liking more years. after? Who are you liking more after this week? Um, the Cardinals or the Rams? Uh, I think it's it's still fifty fifty. Um, mm-hmm. I I still can't believe Cooper Cup is as good as he is this year, but. Um, God. I pick, I picked the Rams at the beginning of the season, so I'm going them. Staying with yeah. them, they picked up Von Miller, which could be huge. That is um, a big trade. The defense could be even better um, coming this week. So, yeah, that's what I was talking about. I don't, I don't know if he'll necessarily play by this Sunday. He does have the full week to learn the playbook, maybe limited snaps or something. You know, it's going to take a while um, for sure by the following week. But the or I don't even know are they, if they're playing this week. They might have a bye. I don't, I don't, I'll look right now. Titans, do, do, do. they play Titans, uh, 11-7. That would be this weekend, which is good for them, I guess. Um, I will say this. The thing I was talking about, Von Miller, earlier today, he doesn't have to play as good as he did in Denver. Like, he doesn't have to be the, the defensive player of the year, but he does, like, it allows for the Rams to be more, like, deep, I guess. Yeah, you know, the front line's so good and the secondary so good. So he's pretty much there just there to make plays if they get past the front line. Just take some pressure off Aaron Donald, too. I know it was a little hard for me to talk right there because I had no clue what you're doing. If you guys are watching, if you guys are just listening to the audio booth, it was like moving around. Did you cramp or something? I don't have a chair here. So I was like on one knee this whole podcast. And wow, impressive. My knee was like getting tired. Just, like yeah, and then I like stood up and it like it was falling asleep and yeah. <laughs> I was like trying to talk and I was like kind of like slow stuttering over my words and I had this whole great thing about Von Miller like to talk about pretty much that if he gets past the front line like he doesn't need to be as good but he just needs to be around the field around the play and I just could not focus I was watching you just like um so if you're seeing this on the YouTube video like yeah I'm definitely I was confused but yeah okay well congrats to you for making it through this whole podcast one knee any last so words on the NFL I don't want you to. Up. Yeah, I don't want you to um, be on that anymore, but good job. Uh, yeah, boost in pain. I can't wait to show this video to everyone. Please watch the YouTube video this week and just scroll to this part. But uh, anyway, I'm going to conclude it right now. Thank you so much for listening to Dudes with some balls. It's been awesome. We talked about some great talks today. We got booth to talk about uniforms. I know I'm talking fast. We're just trying to get them out of here. Thank you so much for supporting us. And get us on the Sacktown jerseys. See you guys. Thank you. Peace.